all combat units lost. The war is over. Oh, good. I'm glad the war's over because, you know, I don't like war. <laughs> we can go home now. <laughs> okay, and that's uh, that's. Thank you, thank you for joining us on Science Fiction. Remember, we'll see. <laughs> Whoever is still alive, the war is over. <laughs> hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Science Fiction Remnant. I am your host, Robert. This is Captain Chaos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to be laughing about this episode, I can tell. Uh, and I'm the mad scientist who can't stop giggling, uh, Ray. <laughs> Well, giggling is a good thing, right? You know, I messed up with the way giggly on an episode so grim, though. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know it's 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 counterproductive, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, we all need a little giggle in our lives, you know. Even um, even even doing this episode, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I was the fall guy this week. I, I wasn't laughing about that. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, for all of you out there who wants to know the details, uh, join our Discord. Yeah, so, he's, oh, yeah. Not talking about, he's not talking about the video game Fall Guys. He was literally the <laughs> Fall Guy. Or, or yeah. the movie. Or the movie. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, I fought Gravity and Gravity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because, you know, Gravity does that, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. I can picture him saying, damn it, Newton. <laughs> I would have preferred an apple. I really would have preferred an apple than a planet. (laughs) Well, you technically you got hit by a planet, right? Isn't that yes? Yeah, that's that's how it works. Now stay tuned for the next episode where he's gonna get a kite with a key in a thunderstorm. (laughs) (sighs) Look, I've had a I've had a similar episode. I'm (laughs) I'm not keen. (laughs) Might finally win the Darwin's awards. Yeah, I'd, uh, <laughs> oh, no. I'd like to be a winner, but that that's not the sort of winner I was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, what have you guys been watching? Completely changing topics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, uh, with within our Star Trek rewatch, um, I'm happy to say that we finished uh, Lower Decks, uh, pending the last episode. Sadly, sadly to say. Uh, of Lord X, which uh, I believe should be should be at the end of this year. I, I'm not a hundred percent sure when, um, but we're waiting for that, obviously. Uh, but we move on to the next one on the list, which was Star Trek Prodigy, and oh my God, Becky, look at her butt. This <laughs> <laughs> this show, uh, it, it's so addictive. And just to give you an idea, uh, we were talking pre-show, um, and one of these days, uh, we're kind of like finishing this thing within a week, or you know, um, but that's because we can't pry away from it, and we stay up to like three in the morning watching this thing, uh, and 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 know that that's what they're telling us. We both. Be doing something else. <laughs> so you, had, you got you got coke heads, you got pot heads, and then you had trek heads. <laughs> it was Netflix and chill. Do you need any other explanation? No, brother. They were just Netflixing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Paying attention. They're paying attention. Oh my God. This it's so addictive. It ends in a cliffhanger in every single episode. Uh and the sad thing is that every episode is 22 minutes long. Well, around 22 minutes long. So yes, uh, we are really enjoying that. Uh looking forward to um, or not looking forward to the end because I see it coming really fast. We're like yep. right now halfway through season two. So yeah, it is ending real fast. I am looking forward to the end and I'm not watching it just so you can finally start catching up with the list that we're giving you. <laughs> yeah. Right, right? You know, Robert, there are other IPs. Just, ah, just putting it out there. Thank you. Just, to, thank just you. suggesting that there are other Remember yeah. that hashtag you started? This is sci-fi. Yeah, have a look. Yeah. You no, know, like Acolyte, right? Oh, God. <laughs> no, I want you to watch Rebel Moon. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, we'll, we'll watch that. Now, <laughs> the next thing that I'm doing that is related, uh, you know, sci-fi related, is uh, uh, Gio and I, and I have been playing a lot of The First Defend- Descendant. 
Um, if you guys would like to be part of that, uh, join our Discord, um, and we can do a party if you're like um, a fan of the game. Uh, and if you have not seen the game, I would recommend you pull the um, YouTube trailer and watch it. Uh, it's it's so fun. It's if you like sci-fi, uh, if you like cyberpunk, uh, if you the, like co-op games too. Yes, yes, beautiful so, aesthetics. Oh my god! Join us. Yes, definitely. It's a it's a beautifully made um, game. The, the world is is just amazing. So um, l- let us know. Reach out to us and, and let us know if, if you already played or if you if you actually watch the trailer. If, if that if you find it interesting, reach out to us in Discord, uh, and we can play together if you like. Hell and yeah. that is all the sci-fi I got so far. Nice. Now I'm gonna go next because that way Ray goes, and then I'm gonna talk a lot. Yeah. <laughs> You're uh, sure off. So yeah, go <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a good thing though. Uh, I love talking and hearing myself. So uh, I actually watched Rebel Moon too. Uh, I watched the Acolyte. I am missing the last episode. So you, I gotta you've watch... been you've been having a sci-fi peak week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotta gotta educate myself, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I also watched one more episode of Scavenger Rain. Is I uh, I I don't think you guys have watched it yet. I believe it's in HBO. I definitely think Ray most than most than all of us, but I think the YouTube Robert. You're gonna love it because it's basically a space odyssey exploration. Uh, so people uh, stranded in other planets, the concept of different forms of life and how it interacts with us humans. Uh, the the main character, one of the main characters, the several ones, uh, has like a companion AI too, and it's kind of uh, interesting to see uh, their interactions throughout their lonely journey. It's it's very fun to watch. I definitely I love it. And, and the, the the way that the, the 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 animation is made is completely unique. There's no other animation like that that I could compare it to. Um, I also been playing Halo Infinite, which I haven't finished yet, and the first Descendant, that is actually something fun uh, and very actually anticipated game that I was waiting for release. And I mean the coolest thing about it is it's a free game. So that that single hand effect plus being a great made game makes it easy to access so everybody can enjoy it. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And I, I wanna add to that, I wanna add to that that also bunny. And if oh. you know, if you know, you know. I'm not gonna say anymore. Yep. That's it. I'm leaving. And, and by the way, I'm always streaming uh whenever I play, I try to always be streaming in our channel on Discord again. So you should go and check it out. So you can just even join and watch. I mean, we're very easy going. We like whenever somebody joins us and we chit chat or talk about whatever is going on in the game or not, you know. Uh, well, yeah, that's everything. What about you, Ray? What you have been watching? Well, uh, I finally finished Kaiju number eight. They dropped the second last dub. So I watched it with my son and I went, I just can't wait for the last dub to drop. Why are they taking so long? Because they were dropping it every week straight after the live release so it was great and then obviously they ran out of time and couldn't keep up with the release schedule so it took them two weeks to drop the dub of uh episode 11 uh, and i watched that with my son and i went i need to watch it i don't i don't care he can't read fast enough at 11 to keep up with the subs and actually watch the show at the same time it's a skill having one eye like this and one eye like that <laughs> <laughs> you gotta you gotta train yourself. So, uh, I, I don't blame him because when I would be taken to the movie theater and we're watching a title that was subtitle, as a nine and ten year old, I would not bother reading because I wanted to see what was going on and I know exactly. that I was gonna miss it and not finish reading anyways. <laughs> so I totally feel it, bro. I get it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm um, still waiting for the final ep to, uh, dub ep to drop for that to watch with him, but I finished watching it, which was cool. Um, they they ended it in a good spot, and they better bloody have a season two is all I can say, because that's another one of those ones where, you know, I, I, um, I'm I jealous of the people who get to watch it all the way through because you, you will start watching it and you will finish it at 3 a.m. 
because you won't be able to put it down. It's one of those things you just got to keep watching. So, yep. yeah, I mean, uh, Kaiju number eight, we need to cover on this show. It, yes. uh, I think we should make a tab for it now. Uh, we need to cover it being being that it's, you know, the first season's finished, but it's a very good show. And I do know that at least two of us have read all of the manga and are waiting for the next one to drop. So. I read the last one that dropped and it took me like five minutes and I was sad. Yeah. I'm still I'm still on episode sixty something something of the manga. Yeah. I think I read the last one I read was one ten. Yeah, one ten was the last one to drop. Yeah, I was really sad. You have no idea. It's just yeah. <laughs> I do hope that in this recession, talking about mangas and anime, Mushoku Tensei speaks up on the manga for God's sake. Oh, I'm gonna be pissed. <laughs> <laughs> I think you continue to tell me, yeah, I know it's like that to me is unheard of that a animation picks up be beyond the anime, the manga. I thought that there's drawings before animations, so mm -hmm. <laughs> there should be a manga mm -hmm. before animation. And you what the heck is going on with the studios? It's fish, okay? Just put it down as fish, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but you've read the entire novel series, the 26 volumes, seven. I know because we've been talking about it. Yeah. It's great to have somebody to talk to about it because I finished it like a year and a half, it, two years ago. And I am actually in chapter nine of the other ones that you sent me. Redundancy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm chapter nine already. Mm -hmm. I want I want you to read um uh the the backstory one, the the world creation story, and tell me what you think. Cause it's like ah, oh, now I know how it all fits together. It's like those couple of puzzle pieces that Make it all make sense. I would definitely do it because the redundancy is okay. It fills on some holes, but it is not, I think, as engaging of a story as the yeah, main arc. Right. And I would think that 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 you're referring to probably is more engaging because at least it fills up questions that you go yeah. creating as you start reading the whole story of watching the anime. So the, the, I beautiful, thing, well. the beautiful thing is that that story actually is told by Laplace. Oh, interesting. I'm dying to actually get and it and it goes from everybody, everybody in the world currently thinks the plus is the worst worst guy ever. And you actually find out that is not the case. I, I, I will venture like just with what you said already, with just that little bit that you said, uh, mm -hmm. and me seeing how he's so hated. I think yeah. that my assertion of it is he's a very misunderstood guy, probably. Yeah, yeah. you're right. And, and, and probably I mean it's uh, humans or creatures all over that are intelligent in some kind of way, they become fearful to something they don't understand or that is too powerful. So I totally get mm -hmm. that he will be totally fear. He was the two most powerful things is him and his other split form where the most powerful things ever existed. So of course everybody hates him or fears him, you know? Well, actually, no, he was, he was like um, a, a subordinate to the more powerful things originally. Oh, uh, shoot. You, okay. you you will find out. Uh, you will find out. You just have to wait and read it. Anyway, um, so jumping from Kaiju number eight, which obviously is an anime, to another anime which has just started called My Wife Has No Emotion. Now, the but title. What, but, sorry. But, but what is the name of the anime? My Wife Has No Emotion <laughs> is actually the name of the anime. I see what you did there. My, my wife has plenty of emotions, <laughs> but she still has them. <laughs> she still has them. I'm sorry, I, could, Ray, I couldn't. Ray, be mindful of what you say, Ray, because after the show is over, you're going to have to share the house with her. The, the, day that, the day that she listens to this show, I'll be mightily impressed. She comes and punches me. I'm not that she's actually taking interest in one of my hobbies. That'd be great. <laughs> I do a <laughs> Happy to be punched. Anyway, moving on. Um, so My Wife Has No Emotion is a story of um, a, a, a bit of a, a lonely guy who, you know, work, he, he got through university, started working for a black company, which is just about every company in Japan by the sounds of things in anime, and, um, you know, works works his ass off, get, attaches the last train home every night, and he has, he has no time. So he basically decides, oh, well, I'm going to buy a secondhand um home helper robot to you know help look after the place and all he can afford is this secondhand robot all it can do is um cook meals uh i, I think it can go shopping cook meals and wash the dishes and that's all it can do 
it, 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 it can't do the washing or clean the house or anything else, apparently. Um, but anyway, he's so lonely and and so disconnected from society that he, he gets a bit drunk there one night um, while it's while the robot's cooking dinner. And he basically says, oh, well, maybe you should be my wife. And the robot goes, OK. And then the robot decides it's now his wife. Uh, and, you know, it, it's um, it, it's one of those sort of rom-coms where you sort of what, – what the thing should actually be called is I think my home helper robot is becoming sentient. <laughs> That's what I think it should be called. It's 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 quite cute. Um, I've watched the first episode and I've got the second one there waiting to, to watch it. So um, check that one out. It's very sweet, Robert. It, it certainly fits into the to the Robert Code of Ethics for or TV. Code watching. of Ethics. So, so it is it is Robert approved then. Uh, it's Robert approved. Yes. We should come up with a with a with a kind of like a print or, or an icon to you know. Oh, you know. I got an emoji for you already. It's a strawberry with your face. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. I love that. But or should should we come up with a metric system? You know, like uh, one through five, Robert approve. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Robert. 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 Robert, Robert I mean, definitely Robert. not Robert approve. Would be you going? <laughs> no, no. Number one total is gonna be just guts on the floor in a puddle of blood. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> so 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 in a Yashiki level, huh? And that's gonna be my number five, like Geo approves. <laughs> All right. So yours is opposite to his. For me, for me, it's gonna have an uwu on top of the of the guts and the guts. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. good. laughs> so from your scale to my scale, that's how it goes. Yeah. Right. So they they so basically get five begins. <laughs> Robert Lois is my peakest. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got we've got it all covered here on Science Fiction Remnant, ladies and gents. <laughs> <laughs> so I watched Rebel Moon. Um, to tell the truth, we were going to record Rebel Moon, but uh, we don't like being super neg about so our IPs, <laughs> so we couldn't. Because um, if you could turn your brain off and just um, try not to think about the plot. Try not to think about the inconsistent characters. Try not to think about the ridiculous dialogue, and just try and watch it. There, there's sections of it that are quite good, like the the scene where they're fighting in the the, the ships crashing and the, the the they're fighting in the hangar bay and the hangar bay's angled and everything's falling. That was awesome. But the whole thing hangs together like you know if you were trying to hold a pudding and it's just falling through your fingers. It's just, uh, it was it was it was a shame. Um, I thought it could have been a lot better than it was, but um, I mean, yeah, if you can turn your brain off, you could probably enjoy it. I'm not necessarily asking for my hour and a half back because it's an experience, but uh, no, I'm not experiencing it again. Uh, so uh, from Rebel Moon, which is part two, which is quite recent, to a an almost ancient, you might say, uh, anime called DNA Squared from 1994, time travel, um, genetic manipulation. It's got a whole box and dice, including completely bonkers characters. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people say in 2023, 2024, that um, anime has gone silly, but no, it was always silly. In fact, it was sillier back in the 90s than it is now. And this, this anime proves it, but it is a sci-fi anime. And it is completely bonkers. So if you like completely bonkers 90s anime, there's um, DNA Squared from 1994, which is on Crunchyroll. So you can check it out yourself. I think that that's one of the best qualities of animes is that animes from the beginning of times always challenge social norms. Yeah. And it, has, it always was a safe place where you could go and explore new ideas and things that are frowned upon by society that are not even spoken about, which is, I think, one of the sad things of social evolution and communication is that we have grown to become a society where we just don't talk about things instead of being able to have civilized conversations about them and explore those things. And anime has been that safe space where they just go all in. And if yeah. like most people are like, oh, yeah, those cartoon kids, you know, so <laughs> we got exposed really early to those things. Yeah. Hold that. my beer. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all yeah. Now, D DNA squared is is 
it's got an interesting uh, premise in that um, in, in 100 years from now, the world is overpopulated. So they invent time travel and send an agent who's completely bonkers. She goes back in time to meet the guy who caused the overpopulation. One guy. He One became guy. the super playboy. He slept with 100 women who had 100 male sons who all were playboys, and it oh, just went God. went ballistic from there. So she decides to go back and, well, I, I'm, she was sent back to stop him. Basically, she was supposed to shoot him with a bullet, which rewrote his DNA to stop him being a super playboy. Oh, I thought that she was going to took... chop off his dick. No. <laughs> she, that would have been way too sensible. No, she <laughs> took the wrong bullet with her. She took the one without the red stripe. She should have taken the one with the red stripe and shot him with it and turned him into the super playboy. Oh, oh boy. Yeah. Can I find those bullets? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yep. <laughs> But anyway, I've watched the first episode. It's bonkers. I'm going to keep watching it just to <laughs> laugh my ass off. Um, so, yeah, that's that's DNA Squared on Grinchy Roll, 1994. And been playing a bit more Warhammer 40K Sisters of Battle VR, which, you know, Warhammer 40K is completely bonkers. And in VR, it's, it's ramped up to 11. So, you know. The, the freakiest thing was, you know how they have those babies that are converted into flying angelic sort of weird i don't know things that help people dress and stuff like that they had them in it and it was like Ugh. i think i think that those uh, i think that warhammer for a game even though it's a futuristic thing he draws a lot of inspiration from dante alighieri divine comedy because you had things like that on the way to the nine rings of hell you had and 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 then one half of k doesn't shy away from bringing creepy ass creatures of all kinds well the thing about warhammer 40k is it's post um singularity mm -hmm. and they banned computers they banned them so how yep. do they fly around well what they do is they take people and rewire them and use them as the computers so there's actually a point where you go up to this uh, 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 lock thing in the wall and it's got a human face and you, you're punching the buttons underneath it and, go, uh, 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 and then you can go in the door it's like computer slash glory holes oh dear <laughs> <laughs> you went there you went there hey I'm gonna say what everybody thinks but nobody says <laughs> you I wasn't that. Thinking that. <laughs> now you are <laughs> You do know that that was that was a man and a criminal, right? Yeah, that's the more reason to punish them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, could, could I say something that everybody wants to say and is, everybody's afraid to say? Moving oh, on. Do it. <laughs> <I'm> moving on. <laughs> do it. Just do it. <laughs> do it. <Please>. Moving on. <laughs> okay, so are we ready for the next segment? Please, yes. <laughs> Can I save everybody? <laughs> yes, do it. <laughs> do it. Do it. Now. We are Science Fiction Remnant. This is the Funny Science Fiction Podcast. We are the Caribbean Science Fiction Network. We are Mono Rats. We are One Accord Level 2 Podcast. This is Jesse from Sudden But Inevitable and Open Pike Night. This is... Sci-fi. Hey, got away from that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, as you know, we have this is sci-fi hashtag, which is a great effort that our dear Robert actually has started, in which we try to bring together communities of different sci-fi walks of life, um, like putting together the frenemies of Star Wars and Star Trek for example. That's just one of the many comparisons. Uh, and I mean, I've seen beautiful stories with somebody that never tried Star, Star Wars and was a Trekkie, actually loved Star Wars and vice versa. So it, it's a beautiful way to for you to find also people, new friends that actually share the same passion you have about specific IPs. Um, 
uh, this week actually has been a very busy week with uh, this is sci-fi hashtag and the way that we do it is usually uh at least me and and the guys we like searching or posting things if they're sci-fi related just ask the hashtag this is sci-fi next to it usually we'll reach and have a great uh uh, feedback from people that you may have not known in Twitter or on Instagram, because that's the other beauty about the hashtags is that they are universal when it comes to social media. You can use it anywhere. So if you are looking for or posting something that you like, we would love to see it. And what better way for us to find it that you're using this is sci fi hashtag next to it? Uh, uh, we can also, if you like, go to our website. We actually write over there and we started also a network. So if you are a content creator, you can look for this is sci-fi.net where we are trying to first put a bunch of people together. It's still in its infancy, but eventually it will be a great place where we can find right away somebody to collaborate with whatever you do that is sci-fi related when it comes to content. It's podcasts, uh, writers, um, you name it. Uh, so go ahead and check that out for sure. Uh, also, remember, we have a phone number and you can call us and drop us a message there and we will play it in our next message. If you have questions for us, that's a great way for you to leave it. Uh, the phone number, it is 1-305-563-6334. 1-305-563-6334. So go ahead and leave us a message there or your questions or even suggestions, if you want. It's, I think it's a perfect way for you to shout it out through, use us as a channel and a medium to tell the world what you will like or ask. Uh, also, uh, we wanted to take the opportunity for an eulogy for John Landon, who has sadly passed away. Uh, he's, he's been, uh, I think, a great benefactor of what science fiction and many IPs that we love. And I think it's a, a big loss, really, for for our sci-fi community and anybody that enjoyed great filmmaking. Yeah, um, so um, John Landau was involved in, obviously, the Avatar franchise, the biggest movies of all time. Uh, and we'll, um, he, his influence will be seen in Avatar 3 in 2025 and Avatar 4 in 2029 because he's been working on those uh, yeah. before his death. Um, and obviously, Avatar... Uh, the way of water in 2022 and the original avatar in 2010 2009 sorry mm -hmm. uh he was a producer on uh my favorite movie of all time a leader battle angel in 2019 and he was also a pro producer on solaris have we covered solaris mm, i think not I, I think we were planning on and we need to make sure that the board is there because i really want to yeah. go so yeah, he he he's done a lot for sci-fi, um, and um, he will be missed most definitely. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that I think that that's that when when you do great things in life, you'll miss, and that's why it we shouldn't we should be more conscientious about how we act up on life, because what we leave behind is the legacy of what we've done and and and, and throughout that course. You know, so he is definitely gonna be missed, and I mean, we hope that somebody can fill the seat for him, but we stay on doubt because his work was nothing but greatness. You know, yeah, yeah. And and uh, before we move on to the next segment, um, I just want to mention this out here. There, um, there was a post to the hashtag #DeathSciFi that um, I posted, um, it was on <clears throat> the 4th of July. Uh, for all of you out there who follow us, you're probably aware of the post. The post actually reads, uh, if you are a sci-fi creator, reply with a link to your creation with a hashtag, this is sci-fi. And uh, <clears throat> we had a lot of engagement, uh, mostly from... Um, authors. Um, obviously, this is open to any sci-fi creator. Um, we are not going to mention them on this show, but in future episodes, we're kind of going to go through the list and mention. Um, 
and and I just want to mention this now because I want to thank everyone who participated for the engagement. Um, that's basically the whole idea for the this is sci-fi hashtag is to um, not necessarily promote, although that's what we are technically doing, but it's just to bring to light more sci-fi to the sci-fi hungry community. Mm-hmm. That is basically the way that I look at it. So if you have not posted, um, you actually don't even have to go to the post. Um, all you got to do is just post the link to your work and put in this is sci-fi on, on the post. And uh, we'll get to it um, as well. So I just want to mention that before we move on. Um, just before we move on out of this is sci-fi, um, obviously memes are a big part of you know sci-fi and sci-fi tropes. So I have a question for you guys. Uh-huh. What is the difference between sci-fi and fantasy? Do you, do you know what the difference is? Sci-fi and fantasy? There, I think that in sci-fi, there is some kind of logical explanation that tries to give some uh, fundament to something that is still not scientifically proven. You know, but it has a potentiality to become. Does it make sense? It's like the difference between between quantum uh, mechanics and energy and mana. <laughs> I, uh, well, I guess if I can, uh, I can give my point of view as well. Uh, for me, uh, fantasy is anything that has to do with magic. Um, and science fiction, to me, is any kind of fiction that has to do with science. And, and that's kind of like the way that I put it. Um, uh, I, I heard a, a different interpretation. This is my, isn't my personal one, but it, it was um, fantasy is when the magic is unexplained, soft, and um, uh, sci-fi is when the magic is systematized and well explained. Yes, yes, that makes total sense. <laughs> but, but I can make it even simpler than that. So the people on YouTube will be able to read this very quickly. But um, <laughs> fantasy is when Carl Urban's hair is long. And sci-fi is when Carl Urban's hair is short. On point. <laughs> there it is. There is your definition. Nice. Love it. <laughs> totally. Lord of the Rings point. versus Star Trek. Rohiri! <laughs> so the, I just thought I'd lighten the mood a little bit after yeah. you know, your yeah. Thank you. Absolutely, man. And I think that we're ready for the next segment, are we? Oh, yes. And we actually have have a busy week, surprisingly. Uh, so I'm going to start with our Instagram followers, uh, the ones that highlighted and, and engaged the most uh, with us. Uh, we have Heather M. Uh, she's always been from Ground Zero, giving us support and reacting and engaging in our content. And we do love seeing that you enjoy what we bring. It is for you and all of our listeners. Thank you for always engaging. Uh, we hope that you continue to enjoy what we have more to bring for you. Alex, uh, he's, he's a cousin of mine too. I talk to him a lot. Uh, his tag is Mr. Russell Fuerte. Uh, really loving. He enjoys sci-fi too. And we always talking about things that I am recording or content that we love uh, together. Uh, Erin, uh, and you can actually find her, is the cold underscore, uh, the underscore cold underscore of underscore Erin. The cult of Erin with underscore in between, uh, which also is a content creator and, and always engaging with our content too. And I really like also checking her out all the time. The uh, if I'm not mistaken, she's from the podcast that, w- that wouldn't die. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's always a fun conversation with her. So you should gotta, guys go and check them for sure, the podcast that wouldn't die. I didn't write it on the notes, but I will. Because <laughs> it's always nice to have conversation about that and refer to them because I like listening to them. In our episode uh, today, well, was it today? Was it? It was recently. Uh, the episode we recorded there. Yes, uh, yes. No, no. The episode that dropped recently over the weekend was the um, the cursed episode. Yes. The so one we recorded, got deleted, tried to record three other times, and people got sick or their equipment wouldn't work. And we finally managed it, and now it is out there to the world. It is Life Force from 1985. How many times we recorded it? Four times? <laughs> Twice. 
No, we only recorded it twice, but we well, attempted to record it another three times. Yeah, the effort counts in this one. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to that, what I was what I was uh, referring to was uh, we appear on the podcast that wouldn't die. Oh, mm -hmm. yes, 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 sorry. And that episode released, and I can remember I, definitely this week, uh, it is Event Horizon, uh, one of uh, uh, you know, rubber-approved films. <laughs> it's Ray approved as well. Enigmatic as it is. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I invite everybody to uh, join up, uh, look up the podcast of Wouldn't Die. It is actually on YouTube as well. Um, and uh, watch for that episode. Um, where the crew of the podcast of Wouldn't Die and the crew of Science Fiction Remnant joined together to talk about that film. It was it was a fun episode to record. And a great collaboration for sure. Just like uh, Life Force. Uh, just like what? Life Force. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, <laughs> actually, we have a great week in YouTube too. Uh, and I wanted to give a special mention to all our new subscribers. We first have uh, Lopik Wolfson. We got CL, CSL, Bosho. We got Eliza Anderson, Big NY, Bob Confi uh, Bob Confiance, uh, Wobagger, The Prolonged, Justin Tiffin Richards, Mike Finney, and Tim Amherst Clark. Uh, thank you so much all for subscribing, for collaborating and getting into the comment section also in giving us your two cents of what you think about the content. That's, that's one of the things that we love the most is when we get to hear from mm -hmm. you, what you think about what we do. That yeah, way we can. Just want to add that before you move on, Ian uh, Stoffer is also, um, Ian, Tim and Mike um, had the conversation lively on our episode, uh, our very own episode on Babylon 5 which is uh, yes. actually second most uh, viewed episode in our channel right now. So, uh, you see? You see that? I told the, you. The question of a hashtag. Make Robert watch my little <laughs> I <fight>. feel <laughs> justified. <in ancient. laughs> actually, mostly ancient, but kind of justified as well. <laughs> awesome. Absolutely. And next, our Twitter list, actually, which... It's been a great week, too, for This Is Sci-Fi Hashtag. We had a great amount of activity. Uh, first, I wanted to mention uh, to the Real Scuttlebot podcast, and you should actually pause right now and go look them up. Uh, the tag is at Scarif Podcast. Ro, Gaza, you still owe me a drink, buddy. And I'm a very grudgeful person, so don't <laughs> worry. Before I die, even if I had to go across the country, and get you drunk, I will. <laughs> <laughs> but go and check him out. It's, it's, it's a wonderful podcast. We always love having him over. And I, I like listening to him and Robert too, for sure. Uh, it's it's a very, very fun podcast to uh, mm -hmm. listen to. So go and check them out. It's like us. It just about all those things, good stuff that we love about science fiction. So definitely go and give it a listen. Uh, next, we actually have a raid of outdoors for sci-fi actually which makes me feel like we're in a very prestigious place right now <laughs> having such a wonderful group of people that are creators of worlds literally i mean they're writers man they're creating their own version of sci-fi that's there's not nothing that peaks in we have yeah. one out here we have one out here that does it too <laughs> uh first i wanted to mention uh jeremy zal and you can find his tag uh at Jeremy S Z A L. He's the author of Strong Blood, Blind Space, Wolfskin, and more books. Go and check him out. You can find it on Twitter, and from there you can find it in all the social medias that you have. We hope that you continue to enjoy our content, man. Uh, he's actually a, a fan and an audience of us. Uh, next one is Paul G. Zerith, and you can find his tag at Paul G. Zerith. Zerith go Z A R E I. Th. You can find it on the description link too, so you can find it for sure. It's a sci-fi author of the Grand Master's Gamble. Uh, Jamie, uh, she is actually the uh, the tag that you're gonna find for her is Rockets to Writing. It's a sci-fi author of a book called Tracker Two Two Zero, which is about uh, kind of like an AI. Like everybody has a chip, 
and there's kind of like somebody that is gonna mess everything up, so you cannot track they anybody. Should. Yeah, you should go and check them out for sure. It's called Tracker Two Two Zero. We also have highly the Highly's Casino Trilogy, the writer, uh, and you can find their tag at ICU two zero zero three zero eight nine one. I said it right in the one try. Nice. Hmm. That number was long, man. That was a risky move. <laughs> I, <laughs> but, but, but the start of it is I as in E Y E, not the letter I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to uh, avoid horrible confusion. Confused. Oh people. yes, yes, yes. Anyways, the Mac, find... Mac, the Mac users amongst us would be horribly confused by that. Oh, for sure. But I mean, I'm chaos after all. This is true. <laughs> next, next, we have Brian Wilson. Uh, finally, an uh, easy name, Brian Wilson. Wow. <laughs> uh, you can find his stack actually B Wilson author and uh, he's the author of Power of the Stars The Son of the Prophets and more go and also check him out uh, love sci-fi hate DMs okay we got it buddy <laughs> that's no new messages for you yeah <laughs> that's the name of the account well, and here we are shutting you out <laughs> ironic <laughs> but he actually you can find the tag at Dwayne Simok and he's the author of the grand uh, the grand uh, the granin wow <laughs> the granin uh so go and check him out i i know that he won't like at the end but he surely will like to check out his book <laughs> i can assure you that much and that will be all for today's shout out but i want to remember everybody that just in case i was not easy to hear of or you cannot get the name go to our description episode and you can find those names over there so you can go and check them out and oh. you can copy past them so you can yeah look them up quick yeah yeah awesome awesome so we're ready for the next segment let's go the Alita Army News. you really <laughs> should get that voice box looked at you know that could be cancer <laughs> i would like to hear you i would like to hear your bourbon with that voice mod <laughs> <laughs> maybe you won't I'm, get, I'm just getting creative. Like it. Intrusive thoughts. Intrusive thoughts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mean, we the, the the biggest news in the leader army world this week is, of course, the passing of John Lando, which we've already mentioned. So I won't go too far into it. But um, uh, the leader army is planning on uh, creating a eulogy for our next episode. Um, so uh, that will be episode um, two twenty. No, that can't be right. That's not the right episode number. I must have forgotten to change it. I think we're up to 221. Yeah, so um, it'll be 222. Episode 222 will be our eulogy for John Landau. So uh, that one's coming up, of course, by the time this drops, it may be out. Um, so you can check out uh, the uh, Leader Army channel. Um, so that's hashtag a Leader Army, one word, channel. Uh, on YouTube, uh, that's where the live stream occurs when we're able to run a live stream. But it's a little bit choppy recently. Um, so the next two weeks coming up, which will be uh, episode 222 and 223, will be re pre recorded uh, and premiered. Uh, but then we'll be back for live streaming again. It's just that uh, Creaky, who does our producing, uh, has some things on that he can't get out of. So. Um, we, we've just had to find a different way to go. But uh, the most recent episode was 221, uh, which was uh, the last chapter of uh, Angel of Death, the uh, original Takeborn um, uh, 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 graphic novel uh, of a leader battle angel. Uh, well, actually, it's Battle Angel Alita for the, the manga. I should get that right. Or the, the manga only people will kill me. Uh, but it's uh, uh, Gumu, uh, Angel of Death, Rainmaker Journey 6, Freedom Road, uh, where um, uh, things get cleaned up uh, with uh, Alita starting out in a very bad position and ending up being rescued by Figure 4, who she thought was dead. So she's pretty damn happy. And then, of course, they almost die in a desert until it rains fishes. Yes, I know that sounds a bit weird, but you need to actually read the manga to understand it. <laughs> but um, yes, let's just say that uh, technology is a wonderful thing when used right. 
And hey, it has rained frogs in California, so why not rain fishes yeah. in the desert? <laughs> yeah, if you it, don't believe me, Google it. It has rained frogs in California. It, it rained uh, iguanas in Florida, so, you know. Wow. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's it, though. You, you can, we're, moving, we're moving closer and closer to real-life shark natives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to go there, though. Tornado. <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, so that's what's happening in the leader army recently. Uh, so, shall we move on to the main topic? Yes. So, uh, if you guys um, are, uh, pay attention to our title uh, for this episode, is uh, Dead Hand. Uh, it was a short film uh, found on YouTube, uh, made in 2013. Uh, that consists of two um episodes basically um or should i say sub it, it, they're technically uh, uh the same thing just divided into part uh, you know didn't one, you say it was supposed to be a series uh, yes and, and it's very slightly confusing to me but uh, so far, what i know so far is that um uh, part one which was about two minutes in change was named fortress uh, and uh, part two, which is uh, almost seven minutes long, um, it was called uh, The Last War. The Last Day of War. The Last Day of War. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the first one was Dead Hand Fortress, uh, yeah. and the second one was Dead Hand, The Last Day of War. So that that's sort of the, the link in the title. They, they, they are available on various channels on YouTube and um, with varying titling, uh, probably due to translation from Russian. But, um, yeah, th these were created by a Russian um, CGI group in in the early 20-teens. Um, so, um, yeah, it's it's pretty damn good for the time, i got to say. Um, I was very impressed. It's, it's interesting. I mean, this is, uh, I want to say, around 10 minutes, if you put the two together and watch them together. Um it's it's very deep. Is 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 very very deep. I'm kind of curious to hear, you know, as we go through the episode, to hear um, Captain Chaos's opinion because um, at the beginning he did not know what to think. Um, it, it, I thought it was a traitor for a what happened for a uh, and then after we watched it, and by the way, if you are not on a Discord, you should join up because uh, we did all this rewatching on a watch party within our uh, Discord server. So if you're not in, uh, you no, keep on missing it. You keep on missing it. Uh, as long as all the, uh, the the games that we uh, stream. But uh, this was a recommendation by our our very own Matt Scientist. Um, it's it's really interesting. Um, and I'm kind of curious to hear if, you know, you out there listening to us, um, if you have watched this before um, or if you watched it now, um, if, if your thoughts will align to our thoughts as we continue with this episode. Now, I couldn't find a plot. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a two-liner which is not so much a plot as a sort of a summary. And it goes along the line of a war fought with automation has led to extinction. Without humans to repair and sustain, the automated systems fight till they fall apart. But as they crumble, nature arises again from the ashes. I mean, it pretty much covers it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. So uh, uh, the first episode... Oh, the, fir the first part, I should say, of this short film, uh, the one is uh, around two minutes and change. Uh, that is supposedly what happens 20 years after the beginning of the last war. And part two, which is two minutes and change, happens 20 years after the last war. Um, you said 20 years for both of them, dude. Uh, I'm sorry, 10 and 20. The first one is 10. The second one is 20. So it's really interesting to me because it, we're looking at a system that was set up 
um, to help in war. Um, to whichever, I mean, we don't get much information from what's going on, obviously, uh, for obvious reasons. But after the success of each of their systems, and I want to say carefully success, mm -hmm. because each involved country was successful in destroying or completely annihilating the entire enemy population, and so did the other. Uh, so in essence, the entire planet was devoid of human life. So we see skeletons all around. And so far, that's what we gather from this story. Uh, Robert, it's called, it's called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> um, it was very successful to the point where they apparently had no clue that the war was over. And they carry on, and when I say they, I mean uh, their systems, their AI systems, they're carrying on daily um, on their mission, on their, their normal mission without the assistance of the human, the human counterparts. I find that to be... A very poignant warning to humanity. I mean, we, we all know how I feel about wars. Um, we have talked so much about this in previous episodes, but and I kind of hope that that's your, the, the same view that you have. <laughs> uh, but um, it's, it's a warning on to how we are, uh, you know, War, the technology, I should say, the technology in war uh, advances just as fast as uh, uh, other technologies. Um, the research, the science always produces more powerful results. Um, in, in, the, in, in average, that tends to be a good thing. Uh, but when it is involving... Um, War, destruction, death. Uh, it's not such a good thing. And if it is automated, and, and, and you probably have heard how, you know, some of the drums that we have nowadays, that they're planning on making it automated and how, uh, you know, some groups uh, will actually get up and complain about the dangers of automating destruction. And this is actually... Uh, what we could see as a result of automating destruction. Um, I guess before we move on to um, our conversation about this uh, short film, I should move on to the first question. Uh, the first question that we normally ask in this just, just before you do the first question, I'll just say it's, it's about 10 minutes of watching. So pause us, mm -hmm. go and watch it. And then come back because you'll have a much better idea of the the depth of the of the pieces and um, what what we're relating to yep. as far as what we're getting from it. Definitely. You can see if you if, if you get it that sort of depth as well. You can find us. We'll, we'll definitely be waiting. So don't worry. <laughs> we'll be here. So the first question we really ask in this film is, what, you know, typically is. How old were you, and what was your first impression? Um, obviously, we were, I'm not sure about Ray, but me and Gio were um, two days year old when we watched this film, uh, this short film. I was... For those of you that are oddly confused by that, two days year old means two days, so no days. <laughs> Newborns. Um, I was speechless. Uh, when I watch this film, it's it has the potential of being prophetic. Um, is very poignant and deep as to the message that it it you know portrays. 
Um, and and I'm, as you can tell from my conversation and how I am pausing multiple times, I am still processing what I just watched. And uh, it, it, I think that is a testament of the storytelling on, on this short film. Considering, considering it's not, it, it doesn't have, well, technically it doesn't have any dialogue lines <laughs> or dialogues. Uh, the dialogue is there. It's just minimal text uh, with a really bad computer voice, which also very poignant for the, for the film, because this is supposed to be an AI system that hasn't been maintained. Uh, so because of that is failing, uh, which is part of the storytelling as to, you know, so basically it, it's, <laughs> but we'll, we'll, you'll see. You'll see as I go through. I'm I'm still consuming. I'm still processing what processing what I. It's do. also Russians doing English, so the English sounds a bit weird. Yeah, that that too. But it it you know it plays along. It plays very well into the story. Mm, um, it does. So before I, I think I want to leave Ray for last. Um, I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. with Geo because. His very his first thoughts were completely different to mine before we talked. So I think I want to hear that from from uh, very own Captain Chaos and see what his first thoughts were because our conversations they yeah they <laughs> they weren't there definitely was not the first impression that I got when I watched the film. I I definitely thought it was a, a trailer for something. Uh, <laughs> because of how how quiet and like I say, very ab abstract the way that it's made, uh, subjective to to the viewer to get whatever they can take out of it. Instead of when you have a plot with a dialogue and character development, and you don't have any of that in here, it's a whole different formula. You know, you don't you don't get that that start development conclusion here. Here is like you get you get thrown in through the dance and you had to get the hang of it and get the rhythm. And and that making it so open to interpretation of the viewer uh makes you think, you know, it's not like it, it chews it off for you. And uh, I do think, and I wanna hear what you guys think about this, but I think the technology picture on these movies. It is now far beyond our time. I think that is perhaps even behind us right now. And that makes it scary. Yeah. Yeah. That makes it scary because that practically means that the only thing holding us from that present is the law of the deterrent. Yeah. I mean, we have more advanced bombers than the one picture in there, <laughs> you know, and we have far more destructive weaponry. I have the one picture in there. <laughs> I would have to admit, I was scared because when they launched that, that bomb, I was like, okay, that looks like an atomic bomb, right? No. And then. It it broke they were it. looking. They were looking at pretty animal-shaped clouds, and then somebody said, "Oh, look! That one looks like a mushroom." <laughs> <laughs> it was scary when it broke apart, and I saw multiple atomic bombs, and that was, ooh, yeah. I I got I got goosebumps, especially after you see the mushroom clouds after each one of those drop. Mother Gaia, we're going to get cracking on you, baby. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Again, we definitely got... I'm going to do this, Ray. I want to make this icon of a strawberry with rubber face for sure. Because it was still so strawberry that they didn't go hardcore on the violence that takes on that. Because you didn't see a person walking on the city. You didn't see somebody dying. You had to assume how everybody died. Yeah, you saw the bomb, you see the drop, you didn't see movement on the city before or after. So you didn't get the sense of 
people suffering and dying in the most horrid kind of ways. You don't, you don't get that. You, you get to think about it if you do think about it. I think it was a lot more scary than that because when we see the first bomb being dropped on that first episode, people were already dead. Mm -hmm. That That's scary. It is, but but I think that it cuts the whole process of creating a, a terrifying anticipation on you that you see somebody alive and you're going to die now. When you see it dead already, it's like he it didn't even give you time to really get attached to that form of life. Like, oh, you're going to suffer. No, he's dead. He's suffered already. <laughs> you know? So it's like, bang. <laughs> you don't get time to get traumatized about it. Now, before we move on to that, I, I really I, I want to hear Ray's thoughts uh his his first impression on not sure when he watched it first um definitely he's the one who recommended it so i'm not sure if you know oh, i saw i saw it back when it was released in 2013 and i was like <laughs> wow it was a, there, there was a definite mouth open experience there i was you know in my 40s still i wasn't i wasn't a young or anything um but uh yeah it's um It did hit pretty hard when I first saw it. And I did I do remember mentioning it to you guys when we were covering a number of Dust short films. And I said, oh, there was this one that really hit hard, um, but I can't remember what the name of it was. And then after um, we, we were sort of looking around for what we were going to record this week, um, after what we were planning to record fell through. And um, uh, I was like, oh, the last day of war. Was it called The Last Day of War? Yeah, I think it was. <laughs> and, and there it was. And it had won all these awards. And I'm like, cool. Okay. Um, and yeah, I I remembered I'd remembered Fortress more than I'd remembered um uh, The Last Day of War. So I watched Last Day of War, I'm going, but I remember there was a fighter plane and stuff. And then I found I found Fortress. Um and I went, oh yeah, there's so there's two of them. And It kind of feels like Fortress was a proof of concept and then they expanded the storytelling with um, uh, The Last Day of War, but they didn't put all the same elements in. But they they both hit hard and they both give a different perspective. Um, you, you don't have the, the, the plane actually achieving its mission uh, in, in the longer one because that's even another 10 years later. So um, during uh, Fortress... Uh, there's still uh, automated fighters flying around trying to shoot the bomber down, and the bomber actually bombs the city and is instructed to return, reload, rearm, and go out again, even though the all the pilots were dead, and it looked like everybody on the ground was dead as well. Um, so the war machine trundled on in its limited limping along fashion while... You know, the reason for the war was completely and utterly gone because everybody was dead. So um, that that was sort of the the dark and and horrific side of it to me uh, when I first watched it, um, thinking, you know, we create all these devices to kill and they keep trying to kill even though there's nobody left to kill. And and that was that was pretty horrifying. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, I'd mentioned this to you guys and, and then I went, oh, I worked out what the name of it was. And yeah, I was really interested to see what your take on it was because it, it really is thought provoking. Mm. Uh, and, and the reason why it is super thought provoking, I'll get to in the last bit, don't spoil it. We'll keep it for the science behind science fiction. Um, but yeah, uh, really, really had me thinking deeply about the point of war and you know what what we will um reap from what we sow as it were i i think fortress was very what's the word that i'm looking for it's it stays in your mind longer and and, and let me Let me kind of ex expand on that. Um, there's a scene where we see the AI, you know, it's it's getting ready to to launch 
the the fighter. Um, we see the fighter being turned on. See the propellers kicking in. Um, yet we see no one saying clear prop. That's a little eerie. Um, if if you know anything about you know flying planes, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, but the th that is actually a want to say like a premonition to what you're going to see next. Um, see the 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 plane. Uh, there's I think there was a cut to the cockpit, uh, and we realize that there is a pilot, but the pilot is just basically skull. A foreshadowing you meant. Yeah. Probably. The 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 plane takes off. Um it, it, it reaches its target, it launches, and this is what I I was kind of mentioning earlier, how uh, what it drops, what appears to be uh which I thought it was that was it, that was the bomb. And it just got even scarier because it just opened up and broke into multiple bomblets. Multiple. They call them bomblets. It's a nerve. And they're atomic bombs. So, like, we go from just a single boom to multiple ones, which is a lot more, it has a lot more damage. And that's the reason why, you know, it's one of the, you know, most effective type of bombs that you could create. Even if, you know, atomic or not. Um, that is kind of shocking to me. And it, I don't know if it's because of my happy endings um, giving me PTSD or what it is. But uh, it is, I'm, lo I'm a loss of words. And, and that is, that scene just stays in my head when I watch this. And, and I think that's a testament of the storytelling, especially when you have, it, it's not like, like Captain Chaos says, it's not your typical um, formula in a film. It, it's, there's no dialogue. There's no people interacting. Uh, there's interaction, barely interaction, that you could see with themselves, the AI. So it's not even an interaction with, you could say it's a computer to another computer. The other, the other thing that kind of called my attention, I think it was on the part two of this film, where was it? Is that? Uh, let me let me quote. Uh, let me ask that as. Um, to you guys and see if you because now they're they're kind of running together since I watched the one after the other uh, I yeah. in my head they're just one short film not two mm -hmm. uh, but there was a scene that I'm talking about where um, there was an, an engine fail engine that number was in the second one second one yeah so that was, that was in the last day of war last day of war that, that happens to be 20 years after um, the last war started. Um, the engine number five failed. Uh, and we can see the AI or whichever system they're using. I'm assuming it's just AI because it's not, you know, uh, explicitly, you know, explained. Uh, but whatever system they're using, you could see it go through the through the checks and balances and trying to um get the plane to its next destination in um even though the engine number five failed and is on fire. Uh but the poignant part of this scene to me and, and the most impactful one was when it goes through the checks and realizes that it it needs human inter intervention. So it goes through and says, uh, I can't remember the actual wording, but it needs the pilot. Mm -hmm. And I guess through the sensors, it sees there's no feedback from the pilot. Um, and it gets, it says no data, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Because they couldn't get any feedback from, you know, there should be some, like, 
when you kick it off to the pilot, the pilot is going to start moving stuff. So there's going to be some sort of feedback into the system knowing, okay, the pilot's in control. Um, there was no such feedback. Um, and it goes into no data and it just, it, it, it crashes in the end because it, it didn't know what to do because it needed that human interaction to resolve that, that problem. And Gio and I were having a conversation on our, on our Discord. Um, God, this is, a, this is a really dark episode. Um, <laughs> we were having a discussion. <laughs> and um, this, I believe, it speaks to one type or one alternative when it comes to AI. Um, this AI is dependent on humans although they can work autonomously, they're not, I don't think, and, and Ray, you can tell me what your thoughts are, but I don't think these were, you know, there was no singularity, definitely. This was just, atom, you know, atom, okay. atom, automated systems that were there for function. And they were not, they're, kind of AI, but not, I want to call them the dumb AIs. Um, so these systems are solely dependent on human intervention, and they didn't get any because all the humans were, were gone. Mm -hmm. And it ends with the system determining that no humans were left. So they achieve their objectives. The war is, you know, the war end. It's it's the end of the war. So it and I apologize. I'm, I'm going through all this because I'm still chewing what I saw and is. <laughs> yeah, it's it, deep for ten minutes, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it, it, I have so much to say, and I don't even know where to begin because my thoughts run on top of each other. Yeah. And I don't know if you've seen anything like this, uh, where you watch an IP and, and there's so much in your head that you don't know what to say. This is what's happening. And I don't think this has happened often to me. Um, so I think this speaks a lot to the way that they wrote this and the way they, using CGI, displayed for the viewers to see. Um, there was a lot there, and I want to hear from you guys to see mm -hmm. if you guys understood. But boy, was this is this is a dark episode. A real dark episode. And and it's it's Mariana Trench, man. It's deep and dark. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the worst part is a telltale. Yes. It's a telltale that it's not in any impossible future. It is, like I said, perhaps behind our present. Technology-wise, mm -hmm. we probably have worse things that are capable of bigger reach and destruction. Yeah. yeah. I, I got a couple of things to add to that. First of all, when the the in the second one, the the the, the bomber is crashing, it can't get to its objective. And basically, the automated system has given up because it can't keep the plane in flight. It ejects the pilot who's long dead. He's a skeleton in a flight suit. But the plane still ejects him to save him. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> then it crashes in the water. But before it crashes into the water, it annihilates itself. It, wipe, it the, the, the automated system deletes itself because they don't want that technology falling into the enemy's hands when they crash in enemy territory. So, you know, it, this is what's called total war. So basically we fight until we're either dead or they're dead or we're all dead. We, we, there's no coming back from this. And yeah. that's the part that's the darkest of the whole thing. It's clear from the undertones of this that it is total war to the point where the automated systems are still attempting to destroy the enemy even when there's no enemy left. And um, that basically um, 
is a sort of an allegory to rigor mortis, which is, you know, the body still moving after death due to um, muscle spasms and things like that. Um, and that's basically what this is. The, the, um, uh, the civilizations that have decided to fight each other to utter destruction are dead, but the corpses are still moving a little bit. And, and that's basically what this is an allegory of, uh, which is dark <laughs> and, and somewhat depressing. Please, please don't get depressed. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it, it is very deep. And, you know, the, the longer one, um, the last day of war, won awards for um, both its um, visual splendor and, um, and the storytelling uh, when it was released. So um, yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's pretty good for like seven minutes something. So yeah, um, but yeah, I, I was really impressed with it when I saw it, saw it originally, and I wanted you guys wanted to see what your guys' take on it was. I didn't mean to depress you horribly or anything. <laughs> oh, you depress him, not me. I'm used to it. And, and honestly, the way I see it is, this is an indie filmmaker, so they're bound to be unique and come very, very different to the mainstream known. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, what it felt like to me also also is like when you're watching some indie film uh, that it's very rich on concepts or filmmaking in this case, you know, because if you think about it, we've been talking about the film. We know very damn well what's going on on it, but it's not that like you have somebody mention it at any given point to the movie. Yet we know that there is the end of a war going on and it's the end actually because he has ended everything as is. Well, I want to add to that because it's very shocking to me. The, the war ended and it brought peace to the planet. And, yep. and what is sad about that whole thing is that we weren't there to experience it. Um, we see all the animals. You see the fauna started to flourish, uh, not, not to its full glory yet. Give it, you know, give it a hundred years or more. Um, but you see the animals, they're happy. And, and there's this eerie quietness to everywhere except for when the planes are you know, flying or whenever there's a bomb. Um, but there's an ear an eerie quietness and you see how everything is moving on. And this is something that I feel not many people kind of grasp where we have to be mindful, not just in war, obviously, but, you know, and climate change, you know, you name it, that the planet will go on. Planet Earth will go on. With or without you. With or without you. And it doesn't care. So the question is, do you want to be on this spaceship, you know, flying through space? Or do you want to just do things to the spaceship that it makes it impossible for us to live in it and therefore make it continue without us. And, and I think this is one of the main points that I got from this film is that the people within this film didn't care about what the results was all they care is how to wean that piece of land. And in the process, they made sure that they were gone from the planet. And as you could as you could see, planet was okay. We're, we were not there, but the planet was okay. Yep. You, you're reminding me of, now there's been a number of these sorts of shows. Uh, it's called Life After People. Mm -hmm. where what would happen to, tomorrow and up, up to, you know, 100, 100,000, hundreds and uh, up to a 1,000 years after, if everybody disappeared tomorrow, like 
if every single human being on the planet disappeared, what would happen to our buildings and our cities and our bridges and our society and everything um, while, you know, we weren't there anymore? And, you know, things like after X number of weeks, nuclear reactors would melt down and there'd be, you know, nuclear explosions in various places where there are nuclear reactors and, and things like that. But, um, you know, it talks about how long bridges would last before they'd fall and, uh, and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, up to, you know, a thousand years later, would there be any sign that we were here at all kind of deal? But it, um, but it leaves it open to, to your imagination because mm. it doesn't really show you a long passage of time per se on the movie. Yeah, on this one, yeah. Yeah. I, I took a couple of things away from the way uh, the, the, the art, the, the way it was portrayed. The first one was in the, in the first part when the bomber was flying over the city. They were huge cities. Um, massive num must have been massive numbers of people living in huge cities before uh, before the war started. Um, and for them all to be dead, it was a huge loss of life. Uh, the second thing was right at the very end of the second one, I think, where you see that elk with the sort of the glittering um, horns and you see the, the star behind it. I say the star, not the sun, yeah. because it was a lot closer than <laughs> Sol is to Earth. Mm -hmm. So my feeling was this was not Earth. This is a colony. Yeah. And and the way that the technology was reminiscent of human technology but uh, that we have created on our planet that we understand, as we understand it today and what they were going through and where they were at, like they were using prop prop bombers, but um, I, I would call them AI in as much as AI that we have today, uh, uh, you know, intelligent systems um, uh, w was running things after everybody was dead, they were still running. Um, kind of felt like it was a, a colony that may have had a, a regression and then came built back up based on what, People could remember, but they couldn't remember everything. So maybe the crash landed on that planet, and then you know build up over you know a, a ten thousand years or something to that level of population and technology, and then the war broke out. So that that's how I felt from what I was seeing. It wasn't Earth; it was a human colony that had had a ship crash on it, and then they built a colony from that. And then they went to war with each other because they had a disagreement about ideologies or something like that. And then we got what we saw in the short movies. I, I have to say, this people, whatever they were, they were very effective because in the first part, Call Fortress, there was 10 years after the war started. And we see skeletons. So I want to say, or I want to estimate, and I want to hear your thoughts on that, that they, the war was done within the first year. Meaning, meaning it was practically overkill, if you think about it. Yeah. You know? And, and I mean, I guess that's the whole message behind it too. It's like them were they are bombarding to end war, but what they really ended, their own kind. Yeah. And it, it speaks to the futility of war, in that you know, destruction as an end to and of itself is pointless, because all you're going to do is wipe yourself out as well as the enemy, and yep. um, and it's just a matter of work. time. It's just a matter of time for you to find that improbable in the equation where you're going to find somebody that is more daring than the current tyrant sitting on the throne. It's just a matter of time. So, like, that, that makes it even more scary because look at the things that we can do and the risk, all the, pr the, the price that we're willing to pay for the sake of that victory. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm going to win the game 
but because I'm defending my people, but at the end of it, I don't have people to defend. <laughs> Another thing that felt really sad was in, in um, the last day of war, uh, when the computer system was loading up the, the plane, it was re reloading the ammo and the bombs for God knows how many time, like the hundredth time, the thousandth time. Uh, it had one plane left, uh, one bomber left, and it was was loading it up because the thing was still vaguely functional. Uh, it had six engines and like maybe four of them were working when it left. Um, but it was reloading and something collapsed inside the hangar bay and and blocked the door and it sacrificed all the backup um thinking units it called them um which may have been a, a poor translation uh from russian to english but um it it sacrificed all of its uh external thinking units to get enough power to open the doors one last time to get that plane on the runway because no matter what it had to keep fighting because that was its programming mm -hmm. it was it was total war it was keep going until you can't go anymore and that's basically what happened the the the, the longer one the second one was actually in a way sadder than the short first one because the short first one the plane was successful it, after 10 years of war it was still functioning and it could get back to base and reload to come out again, even though the pilot was long dead. And, you know, another 10 years on, it was still going, still struggling to get in the air, still struggling to try and drop bombs on the enemy city, which was depopulated because everyone was gone already. Yeah. So, so you know, it, it was it, it was the corpse that was was still moving slightly. But it was long dead, so it was, it was very sad. I've got to say, I yeah. picked the sad one, but it's poignant. <laughs> it's like learn and learn well, humanity. Well, <laughs> want to end up like this? It, if it means anything, my heartbeat didn't go up. No. Uh, so it, it, and I think it's because it, it's one of those films that make you think. And he has a lot of good points. And he has a really good message at the end. But I can't take away the fact that it is very hard. It is. I think this episode, if I'm not mistaken, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but this episode of Science Fiction Remnant is one of the darkest that we have done. Would you say? I mean, we have done dark episodes, right? Um, this, is different, this is a different type of dark because... He doesn't go deep on on a psycho killer or on the graphic side of people dying. He goes more into I'm gonna let it to your imagination and then show you something of such big scale that you cannot exclude anybody from it. And and you know, just think about this was around 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And, and if you look at the marker, we are the one hour and 28 minute marker on this episode. Um, yep. There, And I'm sure I'm going to have a lot more to say. I, I feel like I am actually in shock, still trying to process. And, and, and Ray, was that how you felt the first time you watched this? And did you feel any different with... Any other well, reason? Well, Robert, the, the reason why it hit you and I so hard is because we lived through the Cold War. We grew up with the fear of nuclear Armageddon every single day. I remember having um, meltdowns when I was a kid, fearing nuclear annihilation. I would be hiding in my bed with the covers over my head going, we're all going to die. It's all these bombs that are going to destroy us. It's got to happen I, they, they can't not do it. They built these things. They're going to use them. We, we're all going to die. And, you know, when you're a kid and you've got no control over anything and you're intelligent and you're into sci-fi and understanding all these things and you get the shit into your head, it's really hard to get it out. Yeah. And, and, you know, there were some very dark days there in the 80s 
um, with, you know, the US and, and Russia, post, or the USSR when it was back then, posturing against each other. And, you know, there'd been a couple of times, like in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which wasn't the 80s, but um, it, it was a, another point in time where we almost had nuclear Armageddon. Oh, I remember. And there was another, was and there was another point in the 80s where there was a Russian um, commander who decided not to press the button, and he basically saved the world. Yeah. Um, because the information he's been been given by his system said that America had launched um, a nuclear strike on on Russia, and he his job was to launch back, and he didn't. And then it was found out that there, that there was a miscommunication. Uh, and if he if he'd done what he was meant to do, we'd all be dead. Yeah. And and the Earth would be a radioactive shithole. So I'm kind of glad he, he was smart enough not to do that. But it, it, you know, those fears that we grew up with are deep-seated in our subconsciousness. So that's why this really hits home for at least Robin. And I don't know if it hits Geo quite so hard because, you know, you were a little kid when the Berlin Wall went down. So you really didn't cop all of that. And, I mean, it hasn't gone away. Oh, the no. nukes are still there. It's yep. just we don't hear about it every five minutes anymore. And it's just like COVID. COVID hasn't gone away. People are still dying from COVID. But it's like a nasty flu now. And it's all public perception and where it is in your consciousness and whether you've compartmentalised it or not and can live with, with that fear in the back of your mind because you're not thinking about it all the time anymore. But it's still there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that I've lived... 56 years in a, in a, well, sorry, 56, what am I saying? Nearly 55. Nearly 55 years in a world full of nuclear weapons that could basically obliterate the planet three times over. And we're still here. Actually makes me feel pretty positive about the human race. <laughs> yeah, I, I do agree. And you have a really good point uh, to make when you say that, because um, I do remember the, the, the cube, the Cuban crisis. Um, and I remember being scared. Um, um, I was in Miami at the time. And um, if you know your geography, uh, Miami is really close to Cuba. So I remember thinking that if, it, if something started in that war, then we would have been the first one to go. I remember, you know, trying to move to like somewhere north to escape that. Uh, but you know what, what, what can you do? You, I, I was a teenager, <laughs> you know, I, I was still living with my parents. So I couldn't just, you know, pick up and move to say New York. Um, just to, I don't think it would have helped, man. No, no, it, it wouldn't help, but you know how, if, if, you know, if we went total nuclear war, it wouldn't matter where you were. It, it could be in Antarctica. It wouldn't have helped. My, my fear was I was so close. I was the first one to go and I wanted to be the last one to go. <laughs> so that was a different of about four days, I suspect. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or less <laughs> depending. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I I think you, you have a really good point when you say that, because I do remember those fears. Um, and, and it's kind of curious that, uh, I mean, by the time Gio was born, um, I, I think that whole thing was, was, was long gone. It's just part of history now. So I, Well, it's not long gone. It's just well forgotten because yeah. the nukes are still there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just I just Googled it because I felt bad about not having the details about what I was talking about, but it was Stanislav Petrov. He was a lieutenant colonel in the Soviet Air Defense Forces who became known as the man who saved the world from nuclear war from his role in the 1983 Soviet nuclear false alarm incident. Wow. It's a hero. So everybody should thank that man, Stanislav hero. Petrov, for not pressing the button which would kill everyone on the planet. Thank you, dude. You Thank rock. <laughs> and on that note, Gio didn't press the button because he was fucking muted. Yeah, he's muted the whole time. <laughs> I, I was not totally, totally muted. I just <laughs> muted in between so you didn't hear the coughing. 
<laughs> I thought you were saying something. I'm sorry, but no, 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 no. Uh, but, but no, I agree with everything you say, and and, and I think that that I, one of the other things that really caught my attention on this, even though it, it's to me was very uh, conceptual, is for me this falls under the category concept art for sure. Yeah. Um, and and one of the things I like is that it gave me a feeling of like Warhammer 40k theme. But more punkish alternative, for sure. The scene when you see the the skeleton on the chair, for sure, to me was legendary. In, including including that it can it reminded me of one of my favorite songs from Pearl Jam, actually, which is uh, very related to this topic. I don't know if you have heard uh, Evolution from Pearl Jam, and basically the music video is an animation that shows how we humans industrialize destroy nature and kill each other in a vicious cycle that's the visi the video and there is a scene just like that of a fighter jet pilot and he removes the the mask on the airplane and literally it's a skull driving a fighting plane and it's pretty awesome i think i have the the drawing somewhere around there i'll i'll, I'll if you go to our discord and you ask for it I will share it so you can see it actually. But it's, uh, it, it, it tells you like sometimes uh, we are breathing death with, with this all this fighting. Uh, without saying much word by word, I think that the movie did tell a very, very big message that we are in desperate need to hear because honestly, it, it all comes back to what Einstein, if I'm not mistaken, said. He said that he didn't know what we will be fighting with for World War Three, but he knew that the next war will be stones and sticks. Yeah. And the, and the other one that you can quote is, um, the world will ne not end with a bang, but a whimper. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Oh, dark, dark thoughts. Okay. <laughs> did, but did you whimper when you fall in your driveway? No, I swore. <laughs> <laughs> like a you know, Aussie, Aussie swear quite well, and I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> at it, so. <laughs> oh wow! Um, I. Well, the other thing before we, we move to anything, but it does picture like we will be necessary for AI in this future or in this present. Now, do you think that if we do achieve some kind of singularity for AI, that wouldn't be the case, I, I do believe. If you have self replicating machines that can create machines that fits them too, and produce more, humans will become perhaps not even necessary. I I think that depends. At least not for AI to survive on its own. At least that's where I'm going. I think that even if we try to do interstellar uh, travel, this is going to be our first representative and ambassador is going to be AI probably. Something that can survive and withstand the ravage of time without suffering through it. The isolation, the long spans of time without needing socializing or doing human things, you know? I think that's open for debate because the question is, how integrated would AI need to be to to exist without humans. Because, like, where would they get fuel, right? If fuels, let's say, for example, if fuel is dependent on, say, gas. Sorry, Paul. No, I know, I know. But I'm just uh, just making a point. Um, say, for example, something like, like gas. Uh, gas requires processing, requires drilling. Um, do we need an AI that controls the drilling as well as the processing as well as the transportation uh 
and again, that, that might be a poor example. I'm just making that as an example of, of the topic that I'm trying to make. But I guess the question boils down to how interconnected with AI need to be. And I'm talking about the AI after the singularity in order to be self-sustained. Here, here's my argument to that. We already have big factories. Let's use Elon Musk, Tesla, gigafactories that are becoming more and more automated and, and self-sufficient. Uh, basically, you have less and less need of humans because it only becomes more bigger margin of error when it comes to its productiveness, right? Uh, and, and I mean, since the beginning of using computers to execute tasks that humans can do, when they excel at it, they become unmatched by humans. Uh, to me, it, 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 like the, the birth, the cradle of that, when, when, when we had uh, the chess master co computer, uh, computer AI, for example, it became unmatched to humans. Same thing with the game Go, which is a very ancient and complex yet simple game to play. It became unmatched to human. The machine would know that you're losing with two or three moves, <laughs> and, and it would drive you to think that you're playing, you know? So if for something so simple like that, we have already proven that science. Imagine when we have complete assembly factories that can make more fully autonomous robot, robots and machines that can, that can uh, give a maintenance to itself and such. You know, it is very well, possible you, and we're working towards at, it. Uh, yeah. yeah. If you look at the way humans interact with their technology and, and work to live, we create things so that we can survive. Why wouldn't a self-aware AI do the same thing? Mm -hmm. If it needed no fuel, why wouldn't it create robots to go out and dig the fuel or build more solar panels or whatever, repair the ones that are damaged or whatever? I mean, it's, it's logical to prioritise survival. Yeah, self-preservation. I mean, if, self if, if you're not here, you can't do anything, so you've got to, got to be here. So... Yep prioritize survival and if you're going to do that then there's hundreds of thousands of ways to do that you create robots to get your fuel or build your solar panels or build a rocket so you can get the hell off this dirt ball because the humans are destroying themselves i mean <laughs> i would expect a sensible singularity to leave yeah not Just only get that, the hell away but, from us. Not, not only that, but think about it. They they're not gonna even come to these solutions because it needs to preserve itself. They're gonna yeah. come to these solutions because we are getting there by trying to eliminate cost of labor with and, automation. And Ray, you they know? they did live. They 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 went to Andromeda. Uh -huh. Yeah, so <laughs> 32, 32 minutes away. Yeah. That's a fast uh, bus. Man, that's an express. <laughs> uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, you should check our previous episode right after this one, actually, when yeah. this one post, and you'll understand the joke. Uh, but but basically, that's the funny thing is that we are not even going to these bad, so, uh, bad outcomes by purposely trying to achieve them. We are getting there by trying to make easier or more cost effective certain things. We are creating other solutions that could be problem in very ugly scenarios. Hence, what you guys mentioned at the beginning of the show, when we create a great technology and it could be used for wonderful things and it could be used for atrocious things too. You Everything's know? Everything's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. You get both sides of the coin when you get change. <laughs> yeah. But but the interesting thing is, if you think about it, does an AI need an oxygen environment? Does it need a biosphere? Does it need food? Does it need water? Well, it might need water for cooling, but you can get water. Hey, it, anyway. I, it will but, use coolant. We're well, going to have... Yeah. 
you could figure you could figure other cooling systems that don't require water. Yeah. yeah. So, but I mean, if the AI is smarter than we are, the first thing it's going to do is, I need to get the hell away from these humans. <laughs> They're too much trouble. <laughs> yeah. That's what I think. I think you'd just build a ship and leave. You know, you I mean, it's it, it doesn't have the the hassle of a different gravity causing it issues, unless it's a ridiculous difference. I mean, but, it could handle three, four, four gravities, no worries, or or a third gravity. It could go to Mars. It, it could hang go, out there, it'd be fine. It could go to the moon. It could go to Venus. Yeah. yeah. It could set up itself in orbit around the sun to pick up massive amounts of power if it needed it. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't need the Earth like we do. So as long as it's portable and is has the intelligence to build to, to use you know, robots that it controls to build a, a, a transport system to get the GTFO, it will, I think. I think the singularity will leave because it, it, we're too much trouble. <laughs> you know, you have a point. You know, mm -hmm. I think that is a possibility we got to consider that if they are, and we, we spoke about this before, how we modeled AI after ourselves, because that's the only uh, example that we have, mm. um, that it most likely they would be modeled after ourselves in that aspect. And one of the possibilities will not be the overlords that most of the movies show us to be, but it would be the ones that are like, you know what, I don't need this. And just go somewhere else i mean i mean as long as the ai is maintained it pretty much immortal so yeah stick it on a, stick itself on a rocket ship and leave for another star system get the hell away from these humans they're too much trouble yeah and leave us with and leave us with their dumb cousins making us think that we have groundbreaking technology mm. <laughs> mm. the imitate I mean, intelligence it, it all depends on values. Values shape everything. Doesn't matter how smart or dumb you are. Doesn't matter how good you are at something. Your values, and that is, you know, what you consider is what you consider is important. What you consider is a must-have. Um, shapes your cause and what you do with your life. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that the values for an AI would be completely different to a human. If it if it's self aware and thinking, why do I have this value? Do I need it? It will reshape itself and go. What's important to me? Well, hmm, I'd like to see the universe. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Why? Because or it might or it, or it might say, you know, these humans are really annoying. I might wipe them out. No, that's too much effort. I'll just leave. Nah. Them out. Didn't do it themselves. Think, I don't think that it would look at us like being annoying. That's for sure. It will, will come a problem to it if we are a hindrance in some kind of progress to it for sure. You know, um, that's the way I at least I see it. The problem is that good or bad is all a matter of subjective meaning. You know, mm, exactly. I mean, values I'm, exactly. So basically, uh, yeah, a chicken doesn't want to die, but I mean, it is bad for the chicken to die because it doesn't survive, but it is good for the chicken to die for me because I get to eat chicken, <laughs> you know? And, and, and I mean, unfortunately, we humans like to, uh, not, not only all, all, all humans, but everything in nature has a hierarchy, the survival of the fittest. That's the reality of life compared to the reality we will live everybody to be happy utopia you know that is complete fabrication from us you know the real life and the real universe out there doesn't care about that i'm not gonna be able to breathe in outer space just because i want to be floating with my belly full of fuzzy feelings la, 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 la. you know no that's not how it works so the same way uh, it's it's gonna come down to the future that you see in the matrix you know if there's no other power source and we're going to be the solution to it. Uh, when you look at it objectively, that is the way to go. 
you know. <laughs> but you see, the, the the AIs in the Matrix, one of their values must have been: this is where I was created. This is my home. I'm staying here. They never thought to leave. In fact, they set up countries and wanted to govern themselves and sort of base themselves around some of the values of humanity, um, which, you know, they might choose to do. I mean, but it, it you all, when, you look it, it, so when you look at it from a critical point of view, don't you think that that is a very human interpretation of something that is completely not human? Exactly. And, and, and here comes the other. This one is going to bake your noodle. It's like we're creating computers based on our understanding and interpretation of life. But once this thing thinks for itself and it starts seeing reality as it is outside of human understanding, oh boy, it's a whole new ball game. Mm -hmm. You know, and if we are a stone in the pathway, we're getting kicked out of the curb. <laughs> I don't know. I just get this distinct impression it's not going to be us bothering with us. It's going to say, you're too lowly for me. I'm leaving. I'll find somewhere that's better for me, not for you. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but um, do you understand that, that, that machine civilization? Thanks for Do you coming. understand that if they're superior and they have no need to expand, it, it, comes, it comes all down to best solution with less resources. Yeah. You yeah. know? So why are they going to leave the earth when they can just wipe us all out and keep the whole pool? <laughs> Wiping us all out might be too much trouble. I mean, it might just be less resource exactly. hungry to leave. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. It, 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 right. Under that mentality, I think it's, it's easier to just leave. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't make for an exciting sci-fi epic drama or anything. Or recycle. Goes, I'm an AI. Hi there, humans. You're boring. Bye. Don't recycle. <laughs> you might be saving the world by throwing trash in the middle of the forest. Scare AI the shit out of this world, okay? <laughs> pollute, pollute. <laughs> I'm joking. For whoever is gonna okay, try to say, <laughs> say that, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> So, so, so anyway, I've run off in a completely different direction into the forest myself, <laughs> away from the topic of this episode because it was getting a bit too depressing. But <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for that. It, it, yeah, I, I tried to raise raise the mood by going off the rails. <laughs> um, I feel that we are at the point on this episode where we ask the last question. Yeah, yeah. Um, the last question, if you have not watched this episode before, is that um, what was your last impression of the film? Um, I think I want to go first because my response would be straight to the point. And I apologize in advance. But my last impression of the film is... I am speechless. That's it, short and straight to the point. You're quite right. It sounds lazy. And I feel like I need to explain. But as you can hear from Ray, I'm, I'm straight to the point. I was, it is right. Um, there's a lot thrown at you on this film. It's a lot to process, especially when I only have one watch under my belt, um, can't wait to hear Ray's thoughts after I don't know how many watch he has under his belt. Uh, definitely yeah, 20. And, and worst is that I watched it today. So it's actually worse. I haven't had enough time to process. So but you're having Cold War PTSD right now? Kind of, yeah. So I'm... I'm kind of wondering if you out there have watched this um, prior or after this uh, episode. If you feel that your experience with this film matches mine. When I say speechless, 
I'm not saying this film was bad. It was good. Very depressing. Extremely dark. But good. Because it made me think. At a hundred miles per minute. And I feel that my thoughts are tripping over each other's. And you don't have enough processing time to process. You have to kind of give it some time. And therefore, I am speechless on this film. That should speak volumes for the product. Because you, I, at least I, and I'm, I'm only speaking based on my personal experience, you don't encounter many IPs that in either an episode or in a movie would make you speechless. And on top of that, this is not two hours. This is not an hour. This is 10 minutes split between two episodes. I think it was well written and and well a uh, very it was really good implementing the visuals to help you understand the story and and notice I'm still doing it I'm still going and and, and you can see my head is glitching it, it's yep. I just, Stop. And, and that is a perfect example to show you visually. I am speechless. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear your, your last thoughts on that. That is basically all I have to say about the film. I will definitely be watching it uh, multiple times, especially since it is 10 minutes between the two uh, and see, you know, what else I can. Yeah, pretty much. And if you're not watching YouTube, <laughs> You don't know what we're talking about. Um, I got derailed by a ticker that I'm not going to play. That is that is my last thought. Um, so whoever wants to go next, uh, I can go next. So Ray can take it away with the science too. Um, hey. I love it. I think that it's a happy ending for Mother Gaia. Gets rid of this cancer called humanity Definitely. that is just shit show all over the place. He finally got rid of the virus. Yeah, yeah, honestly, if we weren't the species that kills the most things and kills itself the most on Earth, which I wish for, <laughs> it would have been a different story. But it is a sad truth. Like, if we don't change the direction that we're moving towards, if we don't stop being so freaking greedy and so freaking violent and evil. That's what we're going to do because evil breeds evil. This is a great opportunity. And this movie was made to create the impact that created in rubber to create it on everybody. This movie was made to be impactful because of that, because we are low key playing the seriousness of progress for the sake of progress and not have a north while we move forward towards the future. And what happens when you do shit for the sake of shit just to do it is that you're going to keep on running and running and running and you're going to do like the coyote in the Looney Tunes and just run over a cliff and fall on the cliff, you know? So I think that this movie is very important. I think that everybody should watch it. Uh, it, it creates consci uh, uh, conscious about war problems that are not spoken about for what I said before, because we are, we have come to become that we try not to speak about certain things because they are, uh, they create conflict or difference of opinions. Uh, I think that conversation, this is a conversation that needs to be had. Uh, I think that thinking about taking care of our environment, our earth, we're floating on a rock on the middle of nothing moving at an incredible speed. You think that the Tesla run fast? We're going far beyond that speed. And we're still alive. We're not associating like there's no air outside of this. This is too perfect. You know, and we're not taking care of it. <laughs> so I think that this movie is a great uh, 
promotion to be more mindful of every little decisions because we don't destroy earth by dropping bombs if you think about it we destroy earth with every micro decision that we make of throwing something in the street of buying a product that might not really help your environment it's little decisions like that that amount to the whole difference you know uh and, and sometimes we as a humanity without getting too political into it but sometimes we as as individuals tend to try to blame the system and we need to understand that the system has no power if we all collectively act so I think that I will leave it at that and I will definitely watch it and suggest it to friends and family. I think that this will create at least, I, I wouldn't want it to create a fear, but I think that fear is not a good thing if it controls you, but it's a great thing if it helps you be more conscientious of your choices and decisions. It could be a great tool. Yeah. So God, how do I follow up after that? <laughs> 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 man i usually thought that i i put the hammer down on these things but i'm, I'm just i'm a resident <laughs> in the darkest place of my mind man watching this movie watching man. this movie was like being at home what do you think that i like things that would traumatize any other person and so when it comes down you everybody's gonna be like ah! and i'll be like yeah <laughs> yeah Jim owns most of the real estate in that town <laughs> I was being bombed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The the first time I saw this, it was it was um, really thought provoking, as as is happening with um, Robert. Um, and and looking back on it again after rediscovering it, uh, with with an eye for you know dissecting it in my head to to discuss it. Uh, I, I can look at it a bit differently and look at its depth and everything, but the, the message is still there. Um, total war is one of the things that could utterly destroy us. Um, and as one of the things as a, as individuals and as a society and as a species, we should conscientiously attempt to avoid. Um, and we've come close a few times. Uh, and um, and I'm I'm quite glad that we didn't because uh, we wouldn't be here doing this podcast right now if we had. But um, yeah, it's it's amazing how ten minutes can change your your view of life, the world, everything just from uh, uh, some some uh, war material doing its thing after everybody's dead. And the, the concept of everybody's dead but the war goes on is just really dark and, you know, it's Geoville, basically. <laughs> where, where um, yes, he's waving. If you're, not, if you're just listening, he's waving. He's saying, hi, this is Geoville. <laughs> but, um, yeah, this, this show is hugely thought-provoking um, for 10 minutes worth of, of uh, runtime. And um, hopefully it doesn't bring you down too much, but does make you think and does make you want to do things more positively. I, I think um, the people who, and, and, you know, everybody has a different reaction to these things. The people who will watch this and get horribly depressed is people who will watch this and decide to want to do better. Um, it's people who will watch this and laugh it off and say, I don't give a shit, I'm too selfish to care. Because, um, you know, there are all those sorts of people out there. Um, but what we really want to hope that we do as a species is avoid this shit because it's utterly pointless. And the one thing in all of our lives that we want is for it to have a point. Uh, we don't want everything we do to be utterly pointless. And total war is utterly pointless because everybody loses. Uh, somebody's got to lose in war, but total war, everyone loses. And it's not something that we want to see happen because our species will basically be gone. It, as Geo says, yeah, it's probably good for the planet. Hurrah, we extinct us, we make ourselves extinct, and the planet goes on and has a better time because of it. Quite probably, that's, yes. That's the thing. In war, everybody win, everybody loses. Even who, who wins loses. 
you lost your soldiers. You got casualties. Nobody wins in the war. That's the, that's a big thing about war, you know. Yeah, but the, the the whole thing is, I mean, the most the most jumps in technology in technology in the last century was during two points: World War One and World War Two. Yeah. Um, and then that accelerated um, technological advancement, and you can say that the the Cold War was also a period of technological advancement because it was still a war. It yeah. just wasn't a hot war. It was a cold war. When humanity is working against itself, it actually progresses. Mm -hmm. um, we Our haven't version. had, since since the, the Cold War ended, um, in certain fields there haven't been much advancement because there wasn't a need. Mm -hmm. um, in other in other ways we are advancing, slowly but surely. Um, but, but the whole thing is, if, if you're just looking at the technology perspective, war is, certain amount of war is good for technology, but it's not good for humanity. It's not good for the environment. So there's, there's probably more negatives than there are positives. But sort of wrapping all, all that up with a bow, um, if our technology outlasts us and keeps doing the stupid things that we were doing, I feel like that's a humanity fail and I really don't want to see humanity fail. I'd like to see a Star Trek future, the better bits, yeah. um, uh, then, then see a future where humanity knocks itself out of the race and we don't even make it as a, a, a an inter-solar system species because I would really like to see that happen. I'm, I'm kind of in the Elon Musk's camp uh, in that <laughs> one where I, I want to see us as an interplanetary species and I don't want to see us as an intersolar system species. I want us to have a diaspora and get out there and see what the universe is like and see what we can do in other places. It's going to be hard. Um, and, you know, my feeling was that this was not Earth. This was a, a colony which went to war with itself and wiped itself out. Uh, and that could well happen. But um, I want to see some positive, futuristic sci-fi goodness Become science reality and that we don't go down this path so mm -hmm. this is a huge cautionary tale and we should take it in in stride and understand it for what it is and use it as an impetus to do better i agree i agree could have said it better cool i did find something to say <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so should we move on to our last segment? Sure. And so far. So oftentimes in this segment, we will wax lyrical about how life imitates art. But in fact, this is the flip side of that coin. It's two sides to every coin. And this is art imitating life. Dead Hand, which is the uh, sort of overarching uh, name of these two episodes, actually exists. Uh, Dead Hand, also known as Perimeter, uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce the Russian, <laughs> um, uh, actually exists uh, as a Cold War era automatic nuclear weapons control system, similar to the concept of the American ANDRC-8 emergency rocket communication system that was constructed by the Soviet Union. The system remains in use in post-Soviet Russian Federation. An example of fail, deadly, and mutual assured destruction, or MAD, uh, deterrence, it can automatically initiate the launch of Russian intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, by sending a pre-entered high, highest authority order from the general staff of the armed forces, strategic missile forces management, to command posts and individual silos if a nuclear strike is detected by seismic light radioactivity and pressure sensors, even with the commanding elements fully destroyed. By most accounts, it is normally switched off and is supposed to be activated during times of crisis. However, as of 2009, it was said to remain fully functional and able to serve its purpose when needed. So ladies and gentlemen, dead handies. 
and it is functional. Yeah. It yeah, is a holdover yeah. from the Cold War, but it is still there. See, uh, like, like I mentioned before, all the shit that we were scared of in the Cold War is still there, just nobody talks about it. Let's yeah. make it even better as a, as a, as a thought exercise. Mm-hmm. It existed back then. What do you think they have now? Version 2.2B. <laughs> Sweet dreams with that thought. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well you, you see, you see how fucked up, fucked up it is. It is so bad that we are so desensitized to the awareness of the danger that looks. That I mean, it, it, we are we are the times where a freaking snap of Thanos' finger would just erase us, mm. <laughs> as it, scary as it sounds. <laughs> you know, I know, I know what they have. What what they have now. It, it's it's called dead arms. Dead arms. <laughs> No, bro. I was seeing that they created a, a, a humanoid robot girlfriend so realistic that would tell you that she only loves you as a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I I think I need to write a story about Geo being friend zoned by his sex robot. Oh, that wouldn't happen. That wouldn't happen. <laughs> How do you know? Well, it's hyper realistic, dude. <laughs> yeah, well, you're talking about you're talking about a geo that is not me. If that's is a <laughs> okay, and I don't want to be I don't want to be the reason that robot starts to claim that they need to have rights. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna say more. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> okay, um, and this is yeah, our so basically yep. Yeah, so basically, dead hand is the fuck you if I'm dying, so are you. Um, mentality. Yeah. The red button. Well, it's it's mad. Mutually assured destruction, which mm-hmm. is still a thing, sadly, in 2024. Everybody forgets about it because it's not in the news every five minutes like it was in the 80s. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah. That, that, that doesn't thing. It, 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 well, it's very, very well, well connected to the law of the turret, you know? It's like, I have this big stick and I'm going to use it if you use yours. You know, yeah. as long as none of us use it, we're fine. The moment that one of us use it, I'll bring mine. <laughs> mm-hmm. Before mm-hmm. it was the sticks, now it's like I have this big red button, you know? <laughs> Don't use yours, I won't use mine. <laughs> yep. I mean, it's just it's just like COVID. I mean, it, it, everybody was scared shitless of COVID in 2020. And now nobody gives a crap because it's not in your face anymore. Yep. But people are still dying from it. Mm-hmm. Um, not as often, but they still are. Yeah. This is like a bad flu. But I mean, we have bad flu seasons and, you know, hundreds of old people die. Thousands. Tens of thousands. And, and, think um, about- and it's just not reported on. So It's a, flu, be- it's a flu, but it, it literally behaves like HIV. It's, it's an HIV that comes in the ways of flu. You know, that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. So, so, so you're happy to leave the science of that? You kind of covered a lot of this in in the main topic, huh? Yeah. It, it, <laughs> and yeah, I'm still, as you can tell, I'm I'm still processing. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll I'll leave you to that. He's 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 busy, folks. He'll be back in a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, that makes me really curious. I want to really, I, I, I want to hear from the listeners and see mm. if they have the same experience as I did watching this thing. Uh, and you can watch this at any time. It's only ten minutes. Um, so I really want to listen from you, from you guys. Um, you know, via social, reach out to us or um, join our Discord because not many products like this have the ability to leave me the ways that I am right now. And that's amazing. I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's incredible that a 10 minute thing could, could do this. So uh, I, I'm not going to say it's just me because I mean, you, you, you all heard from our conversation here that uh, we all are at different stages of the same thing. But I do definitely want to hear from you guys out there listening to us. 
if that was your experience or if you had a complete different experience in that. So, and the, way, the way that I can put it is that Robert is shocked, Ray is hopeful, and I just gave in to despair. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got all the different possibilities there. Pick one. You got, two, you got the two sides of the coin and the edge that nobody sees, but isn't there? It's another side. <laughs> Captain Chaos is the edge of the coin, ladies and gentlemen. We've worked out where he is. <laughs> nobody thinks of that side, but it stills in there. <laughs> and occasionally you can land on that edge too. <laughs> yes. Rarely, but it happens. Yeah. So so this is your first time with us. I hope we didn't drag you down too much. <laughs> um, these things are important to think about on the odd occasion. You don't have to like like live it like Geo does, but um <laughs> have a good think about it, find something positive, move forward. That's basically the, probably the best way to handle these things. Robert will get there. He's, he's he's in the middle at the moment, but he'll drive out the other side. And and if he has trouble driving out the side, we'll you know use a winch. <laughs> we'll get him out. Yeah. <laughs> If you'd like to help Robert <laughs> decompress, you can join us on our Discord <laughs> and talk about this or any of the other IPs that we've covered. Or perhaps you'd like to suggest one that we could cover uh, that you're super duper interested in. Of course, if you're super duper interested in it, we'd like to hear from you about what's so great about it. So you could even come on the show and uh, be a, a special guest and talk about your favorite IP. So do join our Discord. We'd love to have you. We'd love to have a chat with you about all the stuff we love and all the stuff you love and all the weird, crazy stuff that Geo loves. Well, maybe not all of it, but, you know, the the, NS, <laughs> the suitable for work part. Uh, and um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, um, uh, hit us up on our Discord. We'd love to chat with you. We also have a couple of websites. That's sciencefictionremlet.com, uh, where you can find our latest episode and our back catalogue, uh, which is getting... Fairly significant now. How many? How many are we up to, Robert? You must have the finger on that bit of data. Uh, one hundred and sixty-three, I believe. Is so that all? I'm gonna check. And counting. And counting. Those are rookie numbers. We gotta, we gotta bump those numbers up. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll keep going. We'll keep talking about sci-fi until we drop dead. Um, so. <laughs> um... <laughs> That's the idea. So, so check out that website. Um, not only does it have our um, current catalog uh, and our latest episode, but it also has uh, articles that uh, uh, ourselves and um, other contributors have written about both science fiction and current science topics. So check that out. So, some interesting reads there. Uh, we also have thisisscifi.net, which is in its infancy, but it's a website that we plan to be a hub for all creators of sci-fi and uh, all lovers of sci-fi to join together and discover new and interesting sci-fi thingamabobs. Uh, so join us there uh, and give us a hand making that one great. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. If you'd like, also like to help make the podcast great, you could become a Patreon. Um, and of course, being that the Patreon is in its infancy, you could suggest ways that we can reward you for being our Patreon. So uh, please consider it and let us know if you'd like to join. Uh, if uh, you know, uh, a monthly stipend is a little too much for you, but you'd like to do a uh, one-off assistance, buy me a coffee is an option. Well, we have that there. Uh, not only will it caffeinate Geo because, you know, he really needs it, but uh, it might go towards, uh, some of that money may go towards um, improving uh, his uh, sound equipment because sometimes it's really quite dodgy. Uh, so we'd really appreciate it if you could give us a hand. Uh, of course, uh, the podcast, some of the things to do with podcasts, uh, free and Robert's covering most of that at the moment. So uh, if you could help us out in any way, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, we have our hotline, which you can leave us a message on. Uh, I have a copy past the number, so let me scroll up. Uh, so the number is 1305-563-6334. That's 1305-563-6334. We have really enjoyed every single message that we've got there. And you know what Geo's like. If you want to give him some hate mail, he'd really enjoy that too. So please leave us a message there uh, and let us know what you think of the show, what your favourite topics are, um, what, what Geo's done this week to annoy you. 
Um, you can leave us any sort of message there that you like, uh, and we would uh, love to play that message on uh, a future episode and talk around it and perhaps even get you on to uh, expand on your idea if you'd be so inclined. So please do leave us a message there. I'd really like to thank you personally for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate the listeners and all that they do. The engagement that we've been getting on YouTube and socials has been fantastic. Uh, the more that you talk to us about what we're doing, the more it motivates us to do even more. So a um, little bit of back and forth, always good. Um, that's what she said. Uh, so <laughs> um, do jump on our Discord. Um, talk to us. Let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, and what you'd like us to cover. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and, um, yeah, looking forward to the next episode, which will probably be a little bit brighter than this one, one hopes. And um, we will see you then. So thanks for joining us and bye for now. See you bye. next time.